I'd like us to turn this morning to our second scripture reading from the second book of Kings, second book of Kings, uh, chapter 5. And the title uh, for my address this morning is A Journey of Conversion. We are presented here in the second book of Kings, chapter 5, with the man Naaman. He doesn't appear anywhere else in the pages of Scripture. It's as if he has come out of nowhere and then goes back to nowhere. But the Lord moved in his life to teach us many great lessons of how the Lord can also move in our lives. And we are introduced to Naaman here in the first verse of chapter 5. Captain of the host of the king of Syria. He was Syria's topmost general. He was the leader of all the armies of Syria. He was in the king's inner court, his inner council. Naaman is presented to us as a courageous man. He was a man of valor. He was a great man with his master. Naaman seemed to have everything he could need in life. He appears to be happily married with a family. He seems to have power and status and influence. And with that, no doubt, would have come riches. Riches from all the raids that were made, probably not only in Israel, but in other lands. Naaman had everything life could offer. What was there that Naaman did not have? If he lived today, we would consider him one of the world's most influential men. He would move in circles that mere mortals as us have no idea of, could only dream of, if we wish to dream of such things. Naaman was one of life's elite, but he had a secret. Now I say it was a secret, I actually am reading that into the passage. Verse 1 finishes with, but he was a leper. Now I'm reading in that it was a secret, but I suspect that if it was well known, he would be ostracized. His men would not serve under him. His men would be too scared to get near to Naaman. And they would not follow him into battle, I fear, or suspect. I think at this stage, his leprosy is still early. And it is a secret. He can hide it. It is hidden beneath his armor, beneath his clothes, when he moves in the king's court. But it is there. And he knows it's there. The king and maybe one or a few others in the inner council know it's there. And his inner family know it's there. What to do about this disease that will take everything away from Naaman? Because as this disease progresses through his life, it will become more and more debilitating. He will not be able to ride into battle. He will not be able to view the battlefield and direct his troops. He will not be able to go into the king's inner courts and reason and advise the king. He will lose everything. Everything will go because of this disease of leprosy. As powerful a man as he is, Everything will be taken from him, and he is powerless to stop it. With all his power, he can do nothing about this disease. Maybe he has consulted doctors, and they have said, we know of no cure. There is nothing we can do. 
and maybe has already felt the debilitating impact of this disease. Maybe he has already experienced the loss of pain and that when he has found himself hitting something or doing something and he has seen damage to his hand maybe and he didn't feel it. This leprosy is taking effect and it is taking away his life. What can be done? Scripture is very clear throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that leprosy is a picture of sin. Sin is debilitating in our lives. It will take from us and it will eventually take everything from us. But like Naaman couldn't feel, had no sense of pain. Sin has numbed us. Our consciences very rarely rise up against us and tell us that is wrong. Do not do that. And we keep many sins as secret as possible. We keep them in our own hearts, in our own private company. But they are there and they make us more and more dull to the knowledge of God and to the understanding of the Lord God. Sin will debilitate us. It will grow in us even as leprosy was bound to grow in Naaman, sin will take effect and it will make us more and more ugly in the sight of God as Naaman would become more and more ugly in the sight of his wife and of the king. And we can see perhaps in our own lives how sin has already begun to make us ugly in the sight of God. We tell lies far more easily than we ever used to. We find ourselves uh, losing our tempers far too quickly. And we do not control ourselves and our rage takes over. And there are so many other sins that we find ourselves more easily attracted to and falling into than we ever used to. And we find ourselves feeling more and more proud of ourselves and who we are and looking down on others and considering ourselves better than others. Sin is getting a hold of us just as that leprosy would get a hold of Naaman. What was Naaman to do? And what are we to do with our sin? And so we read here in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Now why are we told that? because God is going to work in Naaman's life. And God starts it in a surprising way. God starts it in a way that none of us would ever have thought of or considered. God starts it in a way that Naaman is totally unaware of. God brings to Naaman's household one who believes in God. One who knows that there is a God in heaven above. One who knows that this God moves in the lives of individuals to change them and to do wonderful things for them if they will only trust in him. This little maid, we are told, we do not know any more than that about her. This young girl, 12, 15, we don't know. But a young girl 
and she has been kidnapped out from away from her own family and brought into a foreign land to serve the mistress of this powerful man and yet she does not begrudge them kindness and love even though they have shown her none and brought her into slavery in effect but she grows to love them and she is concerned for Naaman and for his wife and so she says to her mistress to Naaman's wife she has learned of his disease and she says there is a man in Israel who can cure him the man of God if would to God that he was with him that man who could heal his leprosy imagine the excitement of Naaman's wife she has despaired and yet this young girl tells her that there is a way of cure there is no cure surely for leprosy and she could have dismissed the words of her maid the soldier who heard them Naaman's advisor he could have dismissed them as foolishness and as poppycock and that is what this world does now to the word of God it dismisses it as foolishness it says there is no sin there is nothing to be ashamed of live as you please there is nothing after death there is nothing to worry about that is the message of this world and so easily we can believe it and be taken in by it and charmed by the entertainments of this world and made to think nothing of what is life about why are we here how did we get here is it all by chance all accident or is there a God in heaven above who has made us who wants us to love him who longs that we should love him and wants us to know him who wants to bestow upon us great love and kindness who wants to forgive us all our sins and make us clean in his sight or will we hold to what this world tells us and there is nothing beyond this life now thankfully Naaman's wife and Naaman's advisor thought this must be worth following up there must be a cure for our Lord and so the Chinese whispers begin verse 4 we're not told exactly what the one went in and told his Lord saying thus and thus say, said the maid now if we read verse 3 she says that he was with the prophet that is in Samaria and it may well be that that is what the man said to Naaman but Naaman had to consider the diplomacy of all this as well imagine if he the general of the Syrian army went into Israel into Samaria with his troops to go to find the prophet that would have caused great alarm and consternation amongst the people of Samaria and in the court of the king of Israel and so Naaman considers this and thinks I need to tread carefully here and so the next person who knows and we're not told how he found out but presumably it was Naaman who went to him and this king of Syria says to Naaman yes you must go go to now go it, it appears that the king of Syria loves Naaman and he does if there is any chance of a cure for Naaman then go you must go 
I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. Everybody's forgotten that the maid said, go to the prophet. She didn't say anything about going to the king. But Naaman and the king of Syria have thought, right, we must go to the king. We must make it clear to him that we are not attacking them, that we are not coming here uh, with uh, bad intentions. And unfortunately, that is what we can do sometimes. We, as we know we have a need. We have great difficulties. We have troubles. We know that there is uh, something wrong in our lives, that we have failed God, that we have, we have characters that we don't want to be like this. We want to change. We want to be different. But instead of coming to the Bible, the Word of God, and reading it carefully, although we hear the truth from someone, we begin to embellish it. We begin to think, ah yes, now I've heard about this way of coming to God. Or I've picked this up from somewhere. Oh, I must be careful what I believe here. I must be careful how I approach. And like Naaman who went to the king instead of going to the prophet, we can find our own ways of trying to alleviate our conscience, of trying to find some way to God that is not in the Bible. And there are many ways out there that man has devised of his own making that say this is the way to God. This is the way to find him. You will find thousands of churches in this land and across the world where they say we must do our best. We must do something. We must try our hardest. We must try to live a good life. Other religions will say you must visit these places and you must offer uh, arms, you must offer uh, kindnesses to people and all these things will count for your good come the day you stand before God. And we have devised as a race, we have devised a multitude of ways to find God. And then people say, well, all roads lead to God. It doesn't matter which one you do. They all lead to God. So we'll be fine. Just do what you can. Come to church occasionally. Read the Bible occasionally. Pray occasionally. Follow Islam for a time. Follow Buddhism and its ideas for a time. All these things that we have invented for ourselves. And it is like Naaman coming to the king of Israel. He's serious. He wants his disease cured. But he's not listened. And he's going about it the wrong way. And that's what we can so easily do. We get caught in this routine. And in the, our own ideas. And this is how I can find God. This is how I can have my sins forgiven. This is how I can be made clean before him, to know him and to love him. And we, we devise our own ways. And so Naaman comes to the king of Israel wanting to avoid a diplomatic incident and instead cause him one. Verse 6. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. They've gone to the king, not to the prophet, not to the Lord God. They've gone to the king, and the king decides they're playing a trick. The king decides they're trying to put him in a position so that they will have a reason to invade the land. 
because he thinks to himself, they must know that I can't cure this man of leprosy, so they're setting me up to fall. We used to say at work, don't set yourself up to fail. And that's what the king of Israel is feeling, that the king of Syria is trying to set up some argument with him here that he will fail to cure his servant and therefore they will invade the land. And Naaman and his king, as much as they want Naaman's leprosy cured, they have completely misread the situation because they did not listen. How much do we think in our own way, with our own ideas, because we have not listened to the word of God? This is where we find the way of salvation. Not in what men say. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach? This is where I must go. This is the word of God. Now I'm not going to start to try and present arguments for why we can say this is truly the word of God. That is for another time. But believe that this is truly the word of God. And when you read it for yourself and you are sincere and you are genuine and you are earnest in your seeking, the Lord will make that clear to you that this is the word of God, that this is the truth and the word of life. And so all seem lost. And that is what happens with our own invented solutions, our own works that we bring to God. They fail. They cannot make us right with God. How can anything I do that might appear good be perfect before God even in those things that I do that might be considered good there will be sin there will be selfishness with it or pride or even deceit will be mingled in with that which is good how can I begin to please God by my own works cannot be done and so Naaman must be standing there before the king of Israel thinking then we were told a lie I will have to go back home and the leprosy will kill me might take 20 30 years but it will kill me now I trust that none of us will react like that, that we have been told a lie, that we have thought there is a way for sin to be forgiven, for us to be made right with God. But because we've had some bad experience, we've said, that's it. I've got nothing to do with God. I'll not follow him. But if we were honest with ourselves and looked at why we had that bad experience, we would have to admit it was down to our own fault, down to our own foolish expectations of what we thought was the way of salvation. That's what seems to have happened here with Naaman. But again, God has not given up on Naaman. God has not forgotten him. As God was the one who brought him, first of all, into Samaria through the little maid, now God is going to speak to him through his prophet. Verse 8, Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes. The word must have got to him fairly quickly. They must have explained the context of why the king had rent his clothes. And so is, Elisha says, let him come now, let Naaman come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. I can do what is required. That was not boasting, that was not setting himself up. He knew he could heal Naaman because God was with him, because he knew the living and true God. That is why 
this church here can stand here and say to those around we know how you can be saved from your sin that is why I can stand here in this pulpit and say that I know how you can be saved from your sin not because I have invented it not because other men have invented it and I am just retelling it but because it is found in the Bible and it is the Word of God and that is why we can be confident in it because it is God's Word not our Word so God had not forgotten Naaman and Naaman listened perhaps Naaman thought ah actually the little maid did say the prophet not the king and now the prophet is telling me to come to him so I'll go to him and so verse 9 Naaman came with his horses with his chariot and stood at the door of Elisha and Naaman if we read back in verse 5 had brought ten talents of silver six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment Naaman perhaps expected to buy his cure and when he comes and to see the prophet he came I find it interesting that scripture doesn't just say so Naaman came and stood at the door of the house of Elisha scripture tells us that he came with his horses and with his chariot as if hinting to us that he still come in not quite in the right way he still hasn't quite got it he still come in in his own strength in his own pride in his own standing look how great I am I have all these horses I have these chariots I have all this clothes that I have brought with me and all this wealth I have brought with me now Elisha surely you will do something for me because look at what I bring and unfortunately even if we get so far in our journey of seeking God still we can come with a wrong attitude with a wrong demeanor with a wrong approach we can come still full of ourselves listen to me God you should be pleased that I am seeking you you should be pleased that I am bringing myself to you look at all that I bring look at the talents I have look at the intelligence I have look at the skills I have think what I could do for you God is that how we would approach the living and true God the infinite and eternal God the one who reigns supreme over all this world do we think that there is something that we can do for him do we think that there's something that we can bring to him that will please him did Naaman think he could buy Elisha's cure that unless he brought this wealth Elisha would not be interested in curing him is that how we can approach God that we think well I have to come with something I have to bring something of myself otherwise why should God forgive me why should he have mercy on me if I can't bring something to him but that is to misunderstand who God is it is to misunderstand the holiness of God to think that there is something that we could do to please him but it is also to misunderstand his love and his grace to think that out of his pure love and kindness he would forgive he needs nothing from us what can we bring to the infinite and eternal God he is rich beyond our comprehension he is powerful beyond our comprehension what can we bring him 
that could change him that could better him and yet we think that there is something that we must bring just as Naaman did but it gets worse for Naaman before it's going to get better because then Elisha had the audacity to send him a messenger Elisha from Naaman's perspective Elisha was too proud to even come out of his own door was that what was going on or was Elisha trying to show to Naaman how he must humble himself that he cannot come to God and demand but that he must come before God humbly and so must we and Elisha sent his messenger what a humbling for Naaman this man who was used to everybody bowing to him kowtowing to him as we used to say everybody would be pleased to have Naaman's blessing and so he was used to everybody standing aside showing him great benefits and showing him great kindnesses and Elisha doesn't even bother to grace him with his presence Elisha sends a messenger to humble him Naaman is still full of his pride of his self-righteousness of his goodness and Elisha sends a messenger and then he tells him to do something that is very humbling there's nothing you can do Naaman just go down into that river and dip yourself in it seven times but you will be clean and Naaman loses it there's no other way to describe it verse 11 he was wroth he was full of anger and he lost it completely and he had a meltdown he went away in his rage and so often that's how we can react to the message of salvation that tells us we have to come humbly that we are sinners and there is nothing we can do to please God and we react angrily to that message no there is something I can do I'm not that bad how dare you speak to me like this and we turn away from the Lord God we turn away from the Bible we want nothing to do with it because it exposes to us our own hearts and we do not like what we see Naaman says behold I thought and it's so often the case with us I thought God would do this or this I thought I could do this or this for God and Naaman is exposed and shown that what he thought was not the way of salvation God himself has told us this in Isaiah in chapter 55 if you want to read it up later behold my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways saith God and that's what Naaman had to learn he thought that Elisha would come out stand before him and strike his hand over the place do some dramatic gesture that would remove his leprosy and that's what we seek so often some dramatic event that God would speak to us directly in some amazing way some event will take place that will wake us up and shake us and say that is God but God doesn't work like that God speaks to us through his word the Bible and God has shown us here the way of salvation and Elisha has told Naaman how to be saved and again God moves 
in Naaman's heart. And God moves in the heart of his servants to reason with him. God will not leave Naaman alone. And we pray that God will not leave you alone. That God will in his kindness and mercy continue to speak to you. To show you the way of salvation. His servants reason with him and they say, if he had asked you to do something really hard, you'd have willingly done it. But he's asked you to do something oh so simple. And it's the same for us. We, we're willing to find some connection with God, some satisfaction with God, some knowing of God, if we have to do something hard. That's why Islam says you must go to Mecca. You must give your gifts to others. You must perform your prayers every Friday. And they have other pillars also. But it's also why we invent our own way, works and things that we would do that perhaps are a little bit hard for us. And we feel good that we have done them. But these things are not right before God. They don't take away our sin. They don't make us clean before God. And God has told us to do something very simple. For Naaman, it was to go into the Jordan and to dip himself seven times. For us, God says, seek me in prayer. Confess your sin. Acknowledge that you are sinful and there is nothing that you can do to save you from that sin. God says, seek me, pray to me, read my word, be genuine about wanting to be forgiven and you will be made clean. But how can I be made clean? How can my sin be taken away? Naaman's leprosy was taken away by the river Jordan. Now, being baptized will not take away our sin. Someone else has to take away our sin. That is why we rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of what he has done. That is why God had to leave his own throne in heaven and become a man that is why the Lord Jesus had to live a perfect life to satisfy God's righteous law he had no sin but we crucified him he went and paid the punishment for sins that were not his own but for the sins of all who will seek him, all who will come to him and ask for the forgiveness of their sin. The Lord Jesus on that cross of Calvary took his father's eternal wrath for sin in his own holy soul and he bore the punishment of it all so that you and I do not have to bear the punishment of our sin for all eternity Christ has borne it for all who will trust him for all who will confess to him their sin for all who will thank him for such love for such mercy God will make you clean if you seek his face and ask for his forgiveness when Naaman humbly went into that, those waters God made him clean when we humbly come before the Lord God ask him to forgive us our sin and thank him for what the Lord Jesus has done to save sinners like us he will forgive us he will make us clean. He will save us. 
and we can rejoice in knowing that our sins are forgiven and Naaman was rejoicing he was so happy that all his sins had been removed his leprosy had gone and that is what Christ can do for us if only we will trust him and ask for his forgiveness let us pray our loving heavenly father we pray indeed that each one of us would be like Naaman in listening humbly to thy word and seeking thy forgiveness that thou would cleanse us in all thy love and kindness in and through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done on Calvary O oh Lord we pray save each one of us that we may all know thee and love thee and serve thee and know thy forgiveness and cleansing hear our prayers O oh Father in the name of the Lord Jesus we ask Amen <laughs>